Oh, hi there. Um, thank you for passing by. I hope this video finds you feeling not too down and that, you know, you're passing through because something caught your eye. Um, I was listening to Good Morning Britain this morning to Piers Morgan, and it kind of inspired me to talk a little bit about my views on what's happening um, with the deaths um, in the care homes. I also wanted to talk about um, house moving, you know, when people are kind of caught up in the middle of a house move during the lockdown and the implications of that. And last but not least, what is last but not least? It's about how, if we can restart the economy and if so, what would it take? So I'll start off with um, Piers Morgan. He was interviewing Edward Agar this morning. And, you know, as usual, I think if I was going on to Good Morning Britain and facing Piers Morgan, I don't think I would go. I mean, you have to have answers. And one thing, I mean, sometimes he's kind of like Marmite. Either you like him or you don't. I never, I liked him at one point, then I didn't like him. And now I seem to like him in this scenario because he is pushing for answers and, you know, they're just fumbling. And it really is quite disheartening when you hear them fumbling and you know that they know the truth, but they can't speak the truth. Because that, to me, is what is happening. You can't tell me that people who are the head of particular departments don't know figures, don't know numbers. But obviously they've been told to keep stum, but at the same token, they're in the line of fire. And so they've got to do what they've got to do. Like I said, people, they want to keep their jobs. So they will put themselves in front of um, Piers Morgan. He's done his bit. He's made it look like, you know, he's pushing for questions. He's looking for answers when, in fact, he never gets them. But, you know, he asks the questions that we all want to know and they get away with not answering it. So um, testing is blamed for the lack of, uh, well, or lack of um, testing is blamed for the for the number of deaths. Um, we're misguided by science, um, according to Piers Morgan, because the science just isn't working. The number of deaths is just increasing, even though they're talking about it's plateauing now. Um, 4,927 deaths in residential care homes, 330 in private care homes. And that is um, that is just an estimate. The Financial Times found much higher figures. And, you know, my personal opinion, and this is just my opinion, is that, you know, when people go into care homes, the um, the perception is, is that people don't care about them, that they're kind of, they're kind of left there to get on with it, because if people cared about them, they'd be looking after them. That's the perception for some. And in some cases, that is the truth. Some people, they get stuck in care homes or some of people, they put themselves in care homes themselves. They can't they can't manage their homes. They sell their homes and they put themselves in care homes. Normally, they're single. Um, they're single because through widow, whether it's widow or divorce, but they're in these care homes by themselves. And, you know, I just think it's a very easy way to kind of... Um, I don't want to be, say, calculating, but it's very easy for people just to die in care homes and nobody knows. And the thing is, with people, because they've got no one to pass their pension, their state pension onto, it dies with them. So you've got all these elderly people, thousands and thousands of elderly people who are dying in care homes. Who and because the majority do not, the majority are probably um, aren't even in touch with their family members, and that's why the the numbers are all kind of topsy turvy. I, I'm sh probably the only numbers that we hear are the ones where the families do actually care about who's in the care homes, but we know we've got people in the care homes that nobody cares about, and so if they die. Who's going to really be inquiring? Nobody. So the one thing I liked about Piers Morgan is that he's made it such that they've had to show an interest in care homes now. 
They've had to justify their their behaviour. And also, they've had to question why so many people are dying. Then we find out that, you know, some of them are going to hospital. Um, they're not tested to see if they've got the coronavirus. And then they're sent back into the into the um, homes. Also, once they're a certain age, they're t- you know, the order is not to resuscitate. It's like people with underlying pro- um, problems. If they've got respiratory problems anyway, or if they've got some other kind of problems. The order in a lot of cases is do not resuscitate. So if something has gone wrong, whatever it, whatever it is, and they have respiratory problems, they're left to die gasping. Can you imagine gasping for breath and being left there to die because they can't, they're not allowed to resuscitate? So we've got a situation now where we've got a lot of elderly dying, and I'm glad that the light has been placed on the care homes. Uh, Piers Morgan was talking about how how come it's only the last 11 days that you've started thinking about um, testing people in care homes. The only reason is because, you know, the light has been shone on it. And I I strongly believe that all those people that were in care homes, they thought they they would be swept underneath the carpet. Nobody would really be interested. They're old. They're neglected. They're in these care homes. I could be wrong. But, you know, it's kind of a sad state of affair that these elderly people, I mean, I know a lot of them on their last legs, but they do not want to die by unnatural causes. Or everybody wants to die naturally. And to have your life snuffed out prematurely through no fault of your own is not a good way to die. And I'd imagine dying from a respiratory illness is a very horrible way to die. I remember my mother when she, you know, a few years ago, for some reason she lost her breath. She said it was the most frightening thing trying to get breath and you can't get breath. And that always sticks in my mind. And when I think about those elderly people who are dying, that's what I think. I think how awful it must be to die that way. It's like drowning, isn't it? So anyway, they're talking about increased resources, but people are clamouring for tests, have been told that resources have run out. Um, Edward Agar said NHS staff and health workers are getting priority and a wider range of essential workers. He reckons that there's a new drive now through a drive-in centre he also says the military are conducting tests in mobile centres and home testing. So he kind of feels as though things are moving along and there's a ramp up in testing. Um, as of now, I believe the, that we've got 152,840 cases in the UK and 20,732 deaths in the hospital. And, you know, the drive for, you know, that increase... So they, you know, that you can justify the testing and justify the vaccines. That's what people are saying. That is how people are feeling, that this is a drive, you know, for some other ulterior motive. But the the thing is, is that I, I have a problem with how people are dying. That's what puzzles me. How are they dying? You know, I mean, so many people, I mean, is it, and I'm sure they're unrelated, well, I don't know if they're unrelated, but, you know, you just kind of think, how do they die? How do they catch it? Is everybody so negligent? But people are catching it. People I know have had it. You know, I work with somebody at work, they told me that one of these people at work have had it because she's come through it. But the fact is, is that if somebody hadn't told me that somebody I knew had it, I'd be thinking, Are they, do they really have it? You know what I mean? And it's not like I'm diminishing it or saying it's not happening. Like, you know, Trump was saying it's, it's like the flu and some people are saying, oh, it's not as bad as it looks. I'm not saying that. My my question is, how are so many people dying from it? 
it's just it's just so bizarre and you know one of the, the one of the ladies that i was saying that had it i mean she's it's not like she's well i don't know then you'd have to ask yourself what about her family then are they being isolated what about her work colleagues i mean she works um somewhere down marsh farm somewhere what about them so it's very um it's very hard to deduce how it's come about how so many people are dying it's like you're in a different world you know it's like you're really in a different world anyway i'm not going to belabor the point because it's not a very pleasant um subject Piers Morgan said the government are misguided by science. They're not guided by science. They're misguided by science because their strategy isn't working. And, um, and no one seems to have the answer. Some people say they're manufacturing evidence to justify the narrative. I mean, you know, there's so much, you know, so much... Um, I don't even want to call it conspiracy theory, but so much different views about about it. I mean, we weren't alive when, um, well, I guess the majority of us weren't alive when the SARS came out. Yeah. But we were alive when the HIV, but some of us were. But my point is, is that I wonder if all of this speculation was going on back then, I wonder if people questioned it, or is is it because we're a new generation why it's being questioned, and is it because um, history is not necessarily repeating itself, but it's very very similar to the past, why people start asking questions and trying to find out what exactly is going on, and is uh, and I think if people, if the government are more transparent. But you all you co you constantly get the feeling that something's being hidden, and I think that is the problem. We we get sense that something we're not being told, and you know I know they have these cobra meetings, and they say they're highly sensitive and you know privileged information, and nobody knows what's said, and they only cascade from those meetings what they want the public to know. But it's it's just like. You know, if people know and they could share it, it would just alleviate so much of the speculation. Wouldn't have to be trying to put two and two together to make four. Wouldn't be so paranoid about the, the, the situation and what's going on. Anyway, um, Boris Johnson, he gave his... Um, speech this morning looked kind of harassed but there again he usually does his hair looks a bit more looks like it needs a haircut but um yeah he was talking about you know saving lives and saving the nhs and you kind of think you're talking about saving lives from the coronavirus but the livelihood you, t you know the livelihood of people is being destroyed so how, what's the point of saving lives if you're killing their livelihood, does it make sense? So you're going to save lives of people. What's going to keep them alive when there's no jobs, no economy, nothing, nothing to look forward to? It, 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 you know, it just, it's just so back to front. Seriously, I mean, they probably would be better. Um, we all risk um, getting it. And those who survive, survive, and those who don't. Because what is the world going to look like in six months' time, if it, if it is that long, when we all want to go back to our normal way of living? What's it going to look like? The businesses are, you know, small businesses, they're not going to be able to keep themselves afloat for six months. And regardless of the government incentives and the government loans, how are they going to keep their head above water? What about all those people who need to pay their rent or pay their mortgage? And I was watching, um, you know, don't can't pay, take it away. You know, I watch, I I love watching programs like that. I don't even know why, but 
I guess it keeps me in touch with reality. And and I was watching one today and this man said, you can't kick me out. I'm a tenant. I have contractual rights. And the bailiffs were saying, we have a court order, a crown court order that that takes over everything. You don't have any rights. You know, you are evicted. You are homeless. You are effectively homeless. And you have to go to the council and they'll house you. If they're going to house a healthy young man, well, not healthy, well, he might have been in his late 30s, 40s. I don't know how old he was. But the fact of the matter is, is that the housing people give priority to families with children. Not a single man. So he's saying, so what are you going to do? Kick me out at the bus stop? They said, I'm sorry, sir. This is it. And if you don't want to leave, we're going to call the police. He was saying, I'm a tenant. You know, I have rights. But they don't have rights. But then I tried to look up on this bailiff website. It wasn't giving you much. You always have to bloody subscribe these days. And for one piece of information, it's not worth me subscribing. But more or less, it was saying you can get bailiff advice. You do have certain rights, but I don't know what those rights are. And I don't know when they become applicable. And there's stages. It all depends on whether the um, the landlord does a first stage, a second stage or a third stage for eviction. So they've got different stages. And then when you see can't pay, take it away, they've gone to the top stage, which supersedes any eviction. So some of these tenants, they get the first stage, which says, OK, you've got 28 days to leave. And then if the if the landlord um, takes a fancy and thinks, oh, no, I can't bother to wait the 28 days. I want my house quicker. They can go to court, pay £66 and get it accelerated. So the, the, let, the tenant has got the piece of paper thinking he's got 28 days and these bailiffs show up and they've got to get out. I mean, it's absolutely horrendous. It's terrible. So what I'm saying is, is that when Boris is saying, you know, we're saving lives and told us to contain our impatience, when you're being bunged out on the street and you can't pay your rent because you don't have a job, what, where is that? You know, their head cannot be where our heads are because they're rich. I think I read somewhere he's about worth 134 million. Is he going to give a toss about people who can't pay their rent? And he's telling landlords, oh, you know, um, you, you've got to waive the rent. Like that guy said, if you really want to help people, tell the banks not to ask for the mortgage or tag the mortgage at the end of them at the mortgage period to give people a break so people stop stressing. Oh, oh. It's, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. It doesn't have to be a mess. And that's why, you know, people who are intelligent, all you need is, well, you don't even have to be intelligent. You just need a little bit of common sense. People have got common sense and see how the government are handling this. That's why they believe it's a big setup. That's why they're paranoid. That's why they get all kind of, you know, what are they doing? Because they realise that if common sense would say that you could do this a different way, you could do this in a way that doesn't have to affect lives in the way it's affecting them. <sighs> so how can we restart the economy? Well, they're talking about they're taking advice from scientists. The scientists that are giving us wrong advice in the first place. The scientists that are that haven't stopped any of the deaths. And all these talented people and innovators, and you know, they're taking advice from them. But those people are not on the ground. These are rich people who do things by, they do things methodically. They have a kind of system. You know, it's a totally different world. They cannot understand the reality of what's happening. And the impact of what's happening because it's not affecting them. Apparently, there's this lady called Rosemary Free, and she's um, she's um, outlined in this 
article, a seven step path. And then it's to do with coronavirus and totalitarianism or something. And um, she says um, the first step is that the virus starts and spreads and it's declared as a p- pandemic. The second step, step two, is that there's daily press briefings to reinforce the narrative of the pandemic. The third step is the ramp up of the testing and pushing for new regulations. And the fourth step is inc- the number of cases plateau but we're told it's too early to determine and restrictions must continue. I think we're at that fourth step. One, two, three, four. We're probably at that fourth step now. And then then there's a dramatic increase of testing, which is kind of, yeah, we're between four and five and tracing, which will result in more people testing positive, of course, because the more people you test, and the more tracing you, you test because of those people who have associated with people who have it, then um, it's a justification to ramp up more testing uh, and vaccines. And then in six months or to a year's time, you if it's seasonal, it all comes back again. So they say they can only restart when they have evidence of change or a plateau. And they reckon that they want to be able to do temperature checks, um, and they but they're not sure if they've got enough temperatures. Um, they reckon they need new laws for businesses because of PPE equipment, cleaning, new new legislation for cleaning, and you know regulating the number of customers that this visit businesses can have. And um, small businesses, well, of course, they're going to be devastated by the lockdown. Will they be able to restart? And then Boris mentioned that the government cannot continue to fund the NHS and healthcare. So what does that mean? That's what he said in his statement this morning. So what's going to happen when they can't continue to fund the NHS? So this is not looking very good, peeps. It's not looking very good at all. And especially when you have to think about, oh, they want all of this thing in place before they can even open up the country. So really and truly, they just want to destroy the country. That's what it looks like. Because, yes, they'd said they're walking a tightrope between um, saving lives and getting the economy back. I mean, you're losing lives anyway. You're going to lose more lives. I'm just like, get the economy back. People die, they're going to die. We're hearing people dying every bloody five minutes anyway. What difference does it make? And then you're talking about another pandemic is going to come in a year's time when even more people are going to die. So what's the point of destroying the economy? And, you know, people dying prematurely because whatever reason, because they, you know, they've got nowhere to live, they're on the street, suicide, whatever it is. You might as well do that herd immunity thing. Get everybody doing whatever. If people don't want to do it, well, it's up to them, isn't it? I don't know what the answer is. I mean, I can understand. I can understand them, them not being able to do it. You know, rationale is, of course, you can't just send everybody back together and out there to um, mingle as it was. But surely you can open up, you know, some of the small businesses so that they can actually start, to, you know, they can start, you know, not such a loss. Surely you can open up and people can go back to work, you know, people who work in industries where there's not so many people and where they can practice um, social distancing. Maybe just less people going back. I don't know what the answer is. Honestly, I don't know what the answer is. So um, the mayor in New York, he was doing his coronavirus, his coronavirus briefing 
and he mentioned in 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 response to the um to the discrepancy um or the disparity of ethnic deaths and the coronavirus he reckons it's structural racism so if it's structural racism with regard to blacks or not, not even so much blacks i think i've heard it's more east asians or asians but whatever it is if it's disproportionate when it comes to blacks or ethnic minorities that, let me just call them ethnic minorities what is it when it comes to the elderly then because it seems to differ in different countries what is disparate so in the, in america it seems to be mostly ethnic minorities that are dying I don't know what it was for Italy because they didn't give us... I think they were elderly, but then they say Italy is a very old country. There's a lot of elderly people there. And as we know, Spain, there's a lot of retirees there as well. But the UK is also mostly elderly and the black. I keep saying the black. I mean, ethnic minorities. So I don't know what he meant when he said they've got to look into the structural racism in, in America because how does that work with regard to the coronavirus? Unless if they're black, they're being informed that they should not resuscitate. Or if they're ethnic minorities, they've been told that they should not resuscitate. That's the only way I can think of it being structural can't think of it as in any other way. Anyway, will we ever know the answers? We won't, will we? And then, okay, moving house. Let's move on to, well, it's not even a lighter subject. This coronavirus affects so many parts of our lives. Um, the British Association of Removers have advised that companies to close down. Um, two people are required, big, oh, yeah, basically because two people are required to move big stuff, and that puts them in close proximity, which they're not allowed to do. So um, what they've advised is that people have to remain in their primary home. But I was reading somewhere where this retired couple, they sold their home, um, um, and it got to the point where they'd exchanged contracts, but they hadn't completed. Um the people who were buying in their home, I don't think they, I, I don't think it was a chain. I think that they were cash buyers. Well, there wasn't a chain on the people who were buying their home. So they could move in. So what the retired couple did, they said, okay, in order to let this couple move into our home, we are going to rent our home. And they kind of given a rough date on what they would do they just wanted to move the stuff out of their house into a rental home until their chain was complete and then they'd move into that set into the home into the home they were buying what happened in the midst of all of this is that so they've secured rental they've started moving some of their stuff into this rental accommodation all of a sudden we've got this lockdown no movers everything shuts down that means they they're having to pay because they had an agreement for that property that they're renting. They signed a contract. They're having to pay rent on that property that they bought. But because of the because of the emergency laws, they have to remain in their primary home, which is the house that they were going to sell. And the people who were buying it can't move in because they have to stay in their primary house. And so you can imagine all that extra expense and just being in the middle of limbo like that. That's what I mean. <clears throat> the different aspects this coronavirus and the lockdown is causing. I mean, I would have thought that would be considered essential. House moves, they should be considered essential. I mean, all, you, all they've got to do is wear certain equipment, the movers. But, I mean, it's such an expensive... It's one of your biggest purchases that you make in your life. And you can't move. And I don't get why they're saying you can't go to your um, holiday home or your caravan home. 
I guess if it's far away, but if you're going in a car and it's just you and your husband, what is the difference between that and going out for exercising? What is the difference? It's two people in a car driving along the road. You're not in contact with anybody. Not unless there is not unless that what they're saying is that you might have the coronavirus and then you might take it to where your caravan site is or where your second home is. But there again, if that's the case, you could infect these people who are you exercising with. Oh, I don't know. I'm just trying to understand the logic behind it all. It doesn't make much sense to me. So, um, no travel. Travel must not include visits to second home, campsites, caravans or any similar. Um, can you take a risk? Do you know somebody who's got a van who could move? This couple apparently don't have anybody, don't know anybody who's got a van or who could um, take it for them. So it's a difficult one. They're stuck in the middle of nowhere in between two houses. So that's all I've got for you now. Not very pleasant, I know, but hopefully tomorrow's another day. Let's see what's going to happen tomorrow. Let's see what Boris is going to come out with. I haven't heard much about Trump today, but there again, he's being given a hard time because of his medicine. <laughs> because of his suggestion about disinfecting. They are, oh, they are riding with that one. So, um, yeah, but I didn't hear much from him. But there again, I didn't look too tough. I had quite a long day. And I'm going to have a relaxing evening. And I hope you're going to have one too. And that's all for now. Bye-bye.